Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Tuesday the 12th of July. Now, the number of infections in terms of COVID-19 are absolutely huge at the moment, and not that many are being officially diagnosed. So in the United States, we've got about 100,000 cases per day being officially diagnosed. The real number of infections, we believe, is about 10 times that, so about a million people per day getting the virus in the United States. United Kingdom, fairly similar situation. Uh, the Zoe Health Study data, 4.3, 4.4 million people currently uh, believed to be uh, symptomatically infected. But then we're going to have a, probably about a million asymptomatic infections or, or more on top of that. So we can say that well over 5 million people are currently infected in the United Kingdom. Absolutely huge numbers of infections at the moment. Um, New daily cases, 351,000 in the UK. And we can see the graph of the overall prevalence. Well, it's getting near, isn't it? Very near. That's as of the 11th of July, getting very near the peak, which was uh, the peak of the Omicron wave there, which was the 3rd of April. Now, the question is, of course, to what extent does this matter? And there's two views on this. Some people are saying it does matter because repeated infections can be quite a problem. Other people are saying, well, repeated infections are getting less and less severe as time goes on uh, and, and um, immunity is being increased. So which of those is true? Well, at the moment, I believe the balance of evidence is saying that this is probably a fairly good thing. It's boosting immunity and not causing a huge amount of long term uh, damage and, and acute illness. But we will be looking at we will be looking at counter evidence against that. So I just want to start off with the United States, where things are basically back to normal from everything I hear. No public health measures. But in the South and the West cases are or infections are certainly increasing dramatically. And population level immunity is driving viral evolution. So, of course, people are most people now, 99 percent have got some uh, antibody exposure in the UK, more than that. So that means by definition, the only viral uh, variants that can proliferate are those that are able to avoid uh, that immune response. So this is the, now the main driver of viral evolution, this immune escape is driving the evolutionary process of the virus and it's driving it quickly because there's so much immunity around. That's what's driving this uh, rapid um, mutational change in the virus itself. BA5 is the most common one at the moment and we know that the antibodies from previous vaccination infection aren't doing too much at all and we're getting massive amounts of reinfection. Now I've been getting huge amounts of questions on BA2.75 now, this is a new variant um, that has arisen in India. Clusters of it have popped up around the world, and I haven't commented on it yet because we don't have firm data on that. As soon as we do, uh, I, I will be discussing that. But at the moment, we don't. So at the moment, we, could, we know it's there. We believe it's increasing. But BA4, particularly BA5, are the variants we have at the moment. Whether the next variant after that will be BA6 or 7 or some other Greek letter altogether or BA2.75, we really don't know yet. So there's no point speculating about that. But anyway, as, as we said, cases in the United States basically flat at 100,000 per day, but infections are surging. We believe about a million per day. Hospitalizations are up slightly in the States. And uh, given the amount of infections, hospitalizations are really up quite slightly, 0.6% on the week. Let's just look at where we are with that. Um, US uh, hospitalizations, this is for all of the United States. Well, this is actually pretty flat at the moment. And I'm expecting that to remain fairly flat given what we know about this virus just now. So um, here we see the peak of the uh, Omicron wave in terms of hospitalizations or the second one. Um, so um, pretty high, no, nowhere near that at the moment. And deaths, this is remarkably encouraging deaths. So again, we see the Omicron waves of deaths there. But deaths at the moment are actually trending down in the United States. Now, this is the thousand line here. So they're still around about the 330 a day mark, which of course is way more than we would like. And this is higher than we would normally have from influenza and uh, pneumonia, especially at this time of year. Um, but it's way down on what it has been. So, as I said, the consensus of opinion is this probably is a good thing because it's generating immunity. 
But I think it's my duty to tell you what the CDC are saying on this. Um, CDC, of course, you can decide what credibility they have. But they're, they're, they are direct quotes. Stay up to date on vaccines. Take precautions, appropriate precautions to protect yourself and others against infection. I mean, clearly we can see that this is not working. People in the United States are not taking precautions now. And this may... This this may be a good thing. There's no evidence, for example, that mask wearing is going to protect us against Omicron infection. The, the mask wearing data, we know it works against Alpha and Delta. But I haven't read any data on Omicron, which is so much more transmissible. It's reasonable to assume there is some level of protection from good quality masks. Uh, and that's what CDC is ab uh, advocating. But we're not going to get into that data or that argument because we have insufficient data at the moment. Now, the United Kingdom... As we said, uh, this has already gone up, hasn't it? That was 350 something now. <laughs> it's already gone up. Um, and that's already gone up slightly um, in the United Kingdom. What, what did we say it was? Um, I think we've it's got the both gone up a bit ju just in the in, in the time I've been preparing this uh, the, 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 this video. So we're up to uh, yeah, we're up to 4.37 million cases now in, in the UK. So, um, and I only prepared these notes this morning, so that's actually gone up already. So very, very high numbers. Proportionate, in terms of population density, proportionate to the United States. Um, and just um, to reiterate that, there's the latest uh, graph from the COVID symptom tracker data. We've already shown this, but that's just the printout of it. When we can see it, there we go. And, and um, it's just, it's not far off, is it? It's getting really, really close to that sort of peak uh, there that we were at and I would expect it to go to there and I would expect it to exceed that. Um, now what does this matter in terms of acute admissions is, is the obvious question. Now here we have the uh, UK official uh, data so cases is irrelevant largely. Um, deaths within 28 days of a positive test are actually up slightly but the very latest data is that they are starting to go uh, down again but uh, let's look at the healthcare, which is really the important one to, to look at now here we have patients admitted to the united kingdom and we see it really is quite high so if we look at the last six months we've got the ba1 if, I, if we look at the year that that's that's the ba1 spike that's the ba2 spike this is the ba5 spike ba4 fire spike and, and there is quite a substantial increase no question about that and if we look at uh, patients actually in hospital again we see a similar increase but we believe about two-thirds of these are either contracted in hospital or people were admitted with it already and we don't have the breakdown on that data so how many of these are being hospitalized for actual covid complications we believe these are the minority and there's no reason to assume the situation is not similar in the uh, United States and then we when we look at the, the part of the reason I'm saying that is we if we look at um, patients in mechanically ventilated beds again uh, we see there is a slight increase but a very slight increase compared to what there have been but putting that in context uh, when uh, Omicron came along intensive care bed use went down really quite dramatically and just a quick look at the deaths data again the, the, the latest detailed data here is that the, 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 these are weekly deaths with COVID-19 on the death certificate let's look at those first actually so well again relatively relatively low and then the ones that were within um, 28 days is that, within 28 days of a positive test again we're looking at a down. We are looking. We're looking at a downward trend. Trend. So that is, that is really quite uh, encouraging. And if you look down on this site I've given you, there's all sorts of fascinating uh, data there. I can't see it there, but the, 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 there's there's other data which shows you much more detail on the uh, on the amount of deaths in terms of colours and all sorts of clever graphics that people are coming up with these days. So the United Kingdom. Um, here we here we are here infections up um hospitalizations up but how many of those are actually for covid is a bit of a question mark deaths are actually down a bit so quite encouraging now we've said that 
we know there's big waiting lists in the health service, and I'm sure it's the same everywhere. People waiting to get to get treatment, but in the UK, it's particularly bad. Um, and given that so many of the COVID cases that we're finding are, are basically uh, incidental findings, sooner or later, sooner or later, someone is going to have to take the decision to stop testing people in hospital or everyone that goes into hospital as we learn to live with COVID. That decision has to be taken sooner or later. So I suspect no one wants to take responsibility for that decision, but one uh, someone senior needs to stand tall and say, look, it's time now to stop testing everyone in hospital. And that would save a whole lot of trouble. But when that when that statement is going to be made, there's no immediate sign of it, unfortunately. So just to reinforce that point, the UK Health Security Agency um, have, uh, have put in a offer um, or, or a bid, uh, the requirement for ongoing supply of additional lateral flow tests and PCR kits. So we want to carry on testing. The NHS wants to carry on testing and they're putting a bid over the next few years for £2 billion. Now, this is a phenomenal amount of money. Now, apart from the damage that's been done to um, you and me in terms of lifestyle uh, from, from the government's ineptitude or what I would see as ineptitude in this pandemic, the financial implications are going to be absolutely huge. If we take, for example, the UK government, test and trace, they spent £37 billion on that and it never worked properly. It never stopped the next, the second lockdown. It's been a complete, well, I think it's been a, I don't know say it's a complete joke, but it's it's been a, a reasonable joke if it wasn't for the fact it was £37 billion. But where is the accountability for, for, for this? All the senior doctors have walked away with knighthoods or damehoods uh, nice pensions, I'm sure. W w w where's the accountability for £37 billion? That's an unimaginable amount of money. Just think what we could do with that if it was properly channeled into uh, healthcare sensibly, rather than being, um, I think I would say, frittered away on test and trace, which never worked properly. It was a complete dog's dinner. Um, certainly never stopped the lockdown. We can, we can say that definitively. The amount of money, I'm, I'm not an economist, so I'm outside my expertise. But uh, th th this money doesn't is not magical. It's just and and the same the same in the states. The amount of economic knock on from this is just absolutely phenomenal. Now let's look at what a few people are saying. The L L Lord Carmel, Health Minister. Now when these uh, people get up and speak, they're not saying, "Well, I think this." They're basically giving the um, official government line, of course. Um, if, current, if, if current increase in hospital admissions is affecting the backlog of about 6 million, which of course it is, clearly measures may need to be introduced. Currently data does not point to cases becoming more severe. So here is saying that the cases are not becoming more severe. So that's like the official government thinking. And, and he's also saying, but what, what we've also managed to break the link between infections and hospitalizations, excellent, and hospitalizations and deaths. But at the same time, is saying that if things get out of control, we'll have to bring back restrictive measures. And if this is the official government thinking, it's clear that restrictive measures with Omicron will not work. What is the government thinking about this? Um, so the government clearly saying here, restrictive measures, lockdown type measures might need to be brought back. I mean, you know, we, we, statements without evidence, as far as I can see. But again, reflecting the UK government position there that the, the, uh, the increase in number of cases aren't as significant because they've broken the link between infections and hospitalizations and hospitalizations and deaths. But, and, and now here's the counter argument. Uh, this is from uh, um, Zayad Al Ali, epidemiologist, University, uh, Washington University, St. Louis. Uh, so there's no public health measures at all, basically. America's letting rip. We're in a very peculiar spot where the risk is vivid and it's out there. Well, OK, uh, that's this view. Uh, but we've let our guard, guard down. We've chosen deliberately to expose ourselves and make ourselves more vulnerable to infection. I would agree. Now, this is the key thing. Now, this is from a piece of research. Here. Now, I'm, I'm not going to break it down because we haven't got time in this video and I'd have to do a detailed prep on it. But it's not peer reviewed yet. But this data is showing, according to um, 
Dr. Uh, I uh, Al Ali. Um, and again, this is not just him. This is there is evidence, as we say, not peer reviewed yet. Multiple infections have a higher cumulative risk of a severe uh, illness or death. Well, I think you can see that that is clearly in contradiction to the British government position, who are saying that the, <clears throat> they've broken these links. So we see a clear contradiction there, and I, I think the British government position is more likely to be correct. So um, Dr. Al Ali is saying, while infections may be mild, he says this, any coronavirus infection carries a risk and the risk of a really bad outcome, a heart attack, for example, builds cumulatively. Well, does it really? If this is the case, then we're in for an awful lot of problems. Now, again, I'm not doing it today because we're lacking time, but we have looked at the excess deaths in the past. We will look at that again. And we're running at about 15% excess deaths in Australia, New Zealand, um, United Kingdom. Officially not in the United States, but I suspect the data is very out of date. So we are looking at a lot of excess deaths. So were these excess deaths caused by various factors, caused by the lockdown measures? Were they caused by the COVID disease itself? Were the, uh, is vaccines partly to, attributable to, to, to the increase in deaths? Uh, we don't know, but but here, here uh, Dr. Al Ali is saying um, the risk builds cumulatively with repeated uh, infections. So clearly contradicting what is being taught in the UK. Uh, and again, go, going back to the topic of uh, vaccines and things, I worry by the time we have a vaccine for BA5, we'll have a BA6 or a BA7 or indeed a BA2.75. So um, he does say with some humility... Uh, this virus keeps outsmarting us. So do cumulative infections cause a cumulative risk? Well, the data we've looked at from the UK at the moment with the reducing death rate says no. So that would mean that would mean that at least in terms of the UK frame of reference that um, this is incorrect. So there's a clear contradiction here between different arguments from data, arguments from data, it has to be said, uh, and um, what we're actually seeing. But at the moment, we are seeing deaths stable or going down. And I'm optimistic that will be the case, as has eventually been the case for virtually other every other virus throughout human history. I don't see why this one should be any different. Um, just a few of the quotes from people in the know. Um, epidemiologist, uh, it feels as though everyone's given up, uh, which is true in the States. But zero COVID is not possible, which we agree with. Now, uh, this is uh, Professor uh, Krumholz, Un Yale University Professor of Medicine. And this is another concern. Percentage of people with severe debilitating ongoing symptoms is probably 1 to 5%. Is that one to five percent of the population? Is it one to five percent of those every time we get uh, an infection? Well, again, this isn't clear. But what is clear is we're going to have quite a lot of long COVID into the future. Um, but I don't think we're going to get the acute deaths as Dr. Al Ali fears from his data. But we, we, we'll keep an eye on that. It just shows how many unknowns there are. Now, I'm going to leave COVID there for today with just a few quick points on the monkeypox that we were talking about on previous uh, videos. Uh, a few of your comments here. Claire, uh, again, these are all in the comments. You can check them. I've just used first names because um, but they, um, uh, they are public domain. They're all in the comments. How quickly the errors of the HIV outbreak of the late 70s, early 80s gets repeated Public officials and many physicians are afraid to step on the wrong toes, so they walk on eggshells in and talk in whispered tones. I agree completely. We have to, and that's why I did this. I mean, obviously, I've been accused of various things as a result of the uh, the monkeypox video that we did and, and the proliferation in, in uh, particularly in the male homosexual community that that uh, is occurring at the moment. Um, clarification on that in a minute. So obviously um, it's a controversial area and I'll, I'll, I'm going to tell you as well why I've talked about it. Uh, Tobias uh, says, um, this is a quote from Tobias's 
commenter, political correctness should not muzzle the truth. I agree completely. And then he goes on to talk at some length about uh, obesity. And I agree completely. And this is part of the reason, Tobias, that I talked about this, because I, I had a, a friend who, um, this was quite a few years ago now, I was, I was in the 30s and hadn't quite formulated this thinking, but um, a significant obesity problem and um, never quite knew how to discuss it with him. And um, he, he died of a heart attack, tragically, um, at, at, a, at a relatively young age, a very young age, in fact. And um, I always felt that I should have um, challenged the topic more. So I do tend to err on the side of the caution of on, on the side of challenging um, um, health problems when I see them. Uh, if unfortunately, that sometimes causes me to step on people's toes then. OK, that's unfortunate, but you know, I remember my friend who died and that seems more significant to me somehow. So good point about obesity from Tobias. Now, uh, Brit, um, the title of your video strongly suggests that homosexuals are the sole carriers of monkeypox. Um, let's clarify that. They are not. The reason that monkeypox is spreading in the homosexual community seems to be not so much that it's a sexually transmitted disease, but the very large amount of uh, int intimate contact that is going on among some uh, segments of this of this uh, population, some segments of the population. That seems to be why it's spreading particularly. It's the close contact, perhaps some droplet effect, perhaps skin to skin contact. Um, that seems to be the main reason why it's spreading in that particular grouping at the moment. Is contact through male to male sex acts? I believe not. As I say, I believe it's a token or uh, it's a symptom of uh, the intimacy. Having said that, can mucous membranes transmit the disease? Yes, yes, we believe it can. Um, heterosexuals uh, will be safe from infection as long as they socially distance from homosexuals. Emphatically not. Um, it could equally well, I believe, be spread heterosexually. Uh, the f but the point is, at the moment, for the vast majority of cases, it is not at the moment. The risk, as I've said before, is household transmission. So um, no cause for uh, complacency because any intimacy, I believe, from what we know about the transmission of this virus, could cause it to spread uh, at the moment. But as we say, primarily in the homosexual as opposed to heterosexual community just now. So are these statements definitive? Well, I think we've answered these. Uh, do you believe they can cause barriers in heterosexual individuals reporting and seeking treatment? Yes, I do. And, and that is a risk and uh, hope, hopefully answering uh, Brit's uh, questions clarified uh, that. Um, I think I'll just very briefly before we finish tell you about North Korea. Um, I'm not, there's not, not a lot of point giving facts and figures from North Korea, so we'll just we'll just uh, I think we'll just we'll just talk we'll just talk about it briefly. It looks like North Korea has had a completely terrible time for the last month or two. It looks like cases there are starting to fall. Uh, coronavirus entered North Korea on foreign objects from South Korea. So obviously this wasn't the North Koreans' fault. This was foreign objects from South Korea coming into North Korea. Uh, polluting their uh, perfect systems, uh, is what North Korea is saying. Uh, it started in a village near the border from alien things. So it was these horrible, dirty alien things getting into lovely, clean North Korea that caused the terrible problems in North Korea. Uh, poor victims uh, and the North Korean political leadership. I mean, this, of course, is farcical to subjugate science and to lie in this way uh, for political ends is totally unacceptable. Um, the uh, State Emergencies Epidemic Prevention Headquarters says vig vigilance is needed with alien things. So the virus has come on clinging to alien things acting as uh, fomites. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. Brought across the border by balloons wild or other climate phenomena so um south koreans letting balloons go into north korea that carried the infection i don't think so all objects if they are found from south korea are to be reported 
purely for health reasons, of course. I, I don't think I need to go on really. It's just um, it's it's just a bit embarrassing, really. But what 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 seems to have happened is that um, there has been a lot of cases. We do believe that the cases are going down in North Korea now. There should be fairly high levels of herd immunity there now. But uh, we suspect a lot of people have died from the virtually non-existent health services that most people in North Korea have. So a tragedy for North Korea. But uh, we'll probably not know until there is regime change uh, in North Korea. So there we are. Um, hugely increasing cases. Balance of probability is that this is just carrying on the trajectory of endemicity and increasing mildness that we'd hoped for for some time. But dissenting voices from the data, well worth keeping an eye on. But at the moment, I'm, I'm let's just say I'm more comfortable than I was a year ago. Thank you for watching.